Well, hello everybody. Glad you're here. My name is Barry McLaughlin. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about talent. Um, I work for Bishop Fox. Bishop Fox is the best offensive security company on the planet. Right? So we'll talk a little bit more about that statement meant later. Not about the company, about brand, about your brand, about uh, how you show up. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, the last 20 some years I've spent all in talent acquisition. Spent time with the big four, fast growth startups, um, did my own thing for a while. Um, so to me, it's, it's all about talent. That was one of my monikers uh, for a long time in building teams. Um, I've seen organizations in scaling from the big four with companies like eBay and Microsoft, where I delivered teams in the past. Um, things have changed, certainly, right? Um, I think we've all seen that. And I think what you can all agree to as well is everything's about talent no matter where you see it, whether that's uh, in your employment, whether that's people that you hire to do services around your home, whether that's the kids you hire to watch your children, a babysitter, it's all about that. And let's face it, today I think there's a deficit in what talent really looks like and how it shows up. Um, stage really moves too, so if you see things moving, it's, it's the stage. Uh, I, don't sit well, I don't sit still uh, real well either. But um, yeah, I, I think as, the, as far as the talent ecosystem goes, I think we're challenged in our industry. I think we're challenged in our projects. I think we're challenged in our own teams. I think we're challenged in management, whatever your role is. How many people are full-time employees in this room? Majority, majority are. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that, uh, what that looks like in, in a talent ecosystem as well, full-time versus a contractor, a vendor. Um, so let's get started. By the way, this is interactive. You got a question, raise your hand. I'm not uh, wait until the end and you know take pictures. So if there's something you want to do, question why I shoot it, okay? All right. Uh, this goal is we're gonna have for today. We're gonna talk about some hiring trends in cybersecurity. This is cybersecurity overall. This is not experienced hiring, only entry level hiring. This is about everything in hiring trends uh, as of this year. We're also gonna talk about, and you walk away to a little bit today about marketing your own brand. My comment about brand, about Bishop Fox being the best cybersecurity offensive leader in this space. You should be thinking about how you market yourself as well. I do. As a global talent acquisition leader, that's important to me as we select talent. And I didn't, I didn't go into that either. That's, that's primarily where I came up from, from technical recruiter into leadership uh, and then managing global teams. So we'll talk about that, about your brand and why that's important. Soft skills, critically important today. You know, a lot of times back in the past, engineers would say, well, I don't need to talk to people. I don't need to, to be a, uh, a personality, slide the pizza under the door and I'm ready to go, right? That was the mentality. In fact, if you think about it, an introverted engineer and an extroverted engineer, the only difference is the extra, extroverted engineer looks at your shoes when he's talking to you. So there's, there's a lot of things that we have to look about as soft skills and how you show up. It's, in your, it's just like in your personal relationships, no difference. And the last uh, we're gonna talk about today is how do you compete? You are competing in your roles today more than ever, in your roles for promotions, in your roles for job changes, uh, in your roles for being selected. Uh, we're gonna talk about getting back to those trends about how to compete. And if you're competing for a job that you're not in today, how do you show up for that? If you're competing for a job against peers to be promoted, how do you show up in that too? So this is gonna encompass all that, okay? Let's talk about cybersecurity employment landscape first. Um, I started the presentation when I wrote the bio, two truths and a lie. You can read these up there, I won't read them to you, but Anybody got an answer of which one of these cybersecurity jobs being resilient, jobs in the marketplace open today, or making a change in cybersecurity is easy? Anybody got a guess? Which is the lie? Somebody said they're all lies. This woman here said three. She's absolutely correct. Um, love that DEF CON shirt, by the way. Um, we, had a, we had a fun time last year at DEF CON and some things that we did in a live stream for Bishop Fox. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, making a career in cybersecurity is not easy, um, and it's gotten harder. I mean, look at the news today, or in the last 24 hours, on a leading company with 18% of its workforce, among it about 400 people. Fantastic company. We ourselves are not immune from it. Nobody is. And so I think what's important is we look at the industry, yes, number one, definitely more resilient in economic downturn. Look at that first national level slide there on the left. That shows a supply demand, that's a supply demand statistic. These statistics are in the middle of Q2 this year. So if you look at this, this is around May timeframe. All this information is posted publicly. There's a phenomenal website I'll share with you later. 
about where you can think about your career, skills for your career, and then also um, you know, where you'd fit into organizations. But the supply side right now is at 69%. That means that 31% of all the jobs, and now I'm talking US, I will talk a little globally too, are unfilled. So uh, 69%, that means there's plenty of jobs. Now, there's plenty of jobs, but I think the scrutiny and, and difficulty in landing a job could be certainly uh, maybe more challenging. But 69% of all open jobs today in cybersecurity are filled. That's everything too, that's, that's a job being done by a human being. Uh, the second, second box there, as far as what you'll see, is total cybersecurity job openings. That's again around May of this year, uh, 663,000 jobs. Now, that's everything from security operations. That's product, that's services, that's everything inside of cybersecurity. And let's face it, it's a tremendously broad industry, right? We'll talk a little bit about some of that as it relates later as far as uh, some change too. Um, and then lastly, if you look at the, the slide on the right, um, the national uh, total employed in cybersecurity today in the United States is 1 million, 1.1 million people. So these are statistics today that matter. Uh, I think as you look at these and you look across on the, on the national level, there's also some tremendous data out there about where jobs show up, what jobs are available. And again, this, this uh, website is free, it's tremendous. Uh, in recruiting, we use it a lot. We use it a lot to market ourselves. We use it a lot to find talent. Uh, for us, like our website says, Bishop Fox, we were remote before it was cool. We'll put people anywhere. We'll find top talent. Like get to an airport, you got Wi-Fi, we'll hire you. So this is the landscape overall today, but you're absolutely correct. Uh, cybersecurity career is not easy. Let's talk a little bit about the talent acquisition funnel. There's three ways to acquire talent. The first is, like it says on the left, you buy it. Buying it, you're making a commitment. It is your highest level of expense as a business is people. Um, by far. I listened to a presentation earlier today on CFOs, uh, and it was about CFOs and comparing CFOs and intellectual property. Um, certainly, it is a huge expense for a business. Uh, Part-time workers, same thing. It's still gonna be an expense. Let, think about benefits alone. A benefited salaried employee costs you roughly 23% of their salary and benefits, 23%. So the expense of that is just not payroll. It's a lot more than that, and it's a lot more how people show up, especially as consume things. Training, for example leave, vacation, all these things are a big expense to the business. And the last way is temporary. You're still acquiring a temporary resource. Maybe it's a part-time temporary. Maybe it's an engagement basis. Maybe it's somebody that you need to augment staff because somebody's going on maternity leave. But those are the ways that you buy and acquire talent. The second way is building it. This was very, very prevalent in the last couple of years, right? Um, do we have a talent shortage to my point earlier in that slide? Sure, we do. I would argue we have, a, we have maybe a... Um, a creativity shortage. How do we find the right person in the right job at the right time? Maybe that's a challenge, right? But today, we'll talk about this in, in entry level, it's hard to find a job right now in cybersecurity if you don't have skills, and it's gotten harder. But companies right now are not building as much as they used to, for two reasons. One, it's again, it's expensive. We're gonna cut costs, we're not gonna put these people through these training curriculums, we're not gonna pay for their certs, go do it yourself and come to the company with it. The second thing that people are looking at now is, Organizationally, as you look at uh, skills and what you're gonna pay for, um, what if it walks out the door? You know, there's a lot of commitments people make to sign a, uh, an agreement. If we train you or we give you a certification, you pay us back for that if you leave within one year, right? So there's a lot more scrutiny around training today too. But that's the second way is to build talent. Um, the third thing I think is today where, where cybersecurity entry level hiring is hard is um, they can't wait around. They can't wait around for you to grow yourself. They, they need you now, they need you on the ground running, and they need you to be productive. So building has gone a little bit quieter uh, as far as acquiring talent. And the third way is getting more prevalent, and that's the borrow. Uh, I say contractors, that could be independent, that could be somebody that's hung their own shingle, uh, so to speak, and gone out on their own. Um, it could be partners. There's a lot of good partners out there that are willing to take on projects. Maybe it's a deliverable base. Maybe it's a fixed fee. Maybe it's an engagement where they just need help to get it done because, again, they're not going to hire you as a full-time employee. So borrowing is a real viable way right now to solicit talent. There's also less uncertainty. So if you bring a contractor in, guess what? Things get changed and things go slow down. What do you do? You get rid of the contractor. Or you get rid of the employee if they're not as good as the contractor, right? But at the end of the day, um, the contractor, partner, vendor model in competing for talent today is making that landscape even harder. Now, you might say to yourself, 
I want to go do my own thing. I want to be my own boss, right? Everybody does. Um, but the, the challenge with that, too, is that it's marketing. I mean, it's one thing to land a gig. It's another to get the next gig. And the Peter Principle model in a management philosophy is you're only as good as your last gig or your last deliverable, right? So making that change into what would be a borrow model is difficult. However, there could be flexibility. There could be choosing what you want to do. There could be more pickiness. There could be more time to take time away. Um, so maybe, maybe that's a, a model, too, that's interesting to you. But there's pitfalls to that as well. They're all, all, all of them are. But uh, today, in the landscape, especially in the last nine months, organizations are looking at talent from a contract borrow perspective. Use it when you need it. Don't put it and sit it around. Don't have somebody uh, you know, waiting on the bench, if you will. Uh, they want those skills. And so we're going to talk a little bit about defining that further about how you can be more resilient, how you look at a career opportunity and the capacity you have to do other things. That's really, really important. I think it's important. We want to hire people like that. We do hire people like that because as we take the field, we all have the same helmet on. We all have the same jersey. We look the same. It doesn't matter if you're a contractor or full-time. An organization's got to deliver. And um, you're going to see yourself in a lot of situations where you're going to sit alongside somebody that's a contractor. They work eight hours. You know they make more money than you. They, you know that a contractor is going to be paying on the hour, right? They might not need benefits. They might have it through a spouse. But it's an interesting dynamic, I think. But I feel like in talent, you need, to, you need all three. You, you can't just sit there and say, oh, we're just going to hire all employees. That was back in GE days 40 years ago. It doesn't exist anymore. Any questions on that? Please. It's a great question. The, uh, the question that came from the front was, how does co company culture get impacted by contractors versus full-time employees? It's a really good question. Um, I think two ways, probably. The first way is um, there has to be unity in the workforce. And if there's not, there's a division of us or them. There, they, there has to be a bridge between we're here to deliver as a team. But the second challenge is they don't have the same helmet on. They don't have the same commitment. They might not have the same goal or purpose. Maybe it's money motivated. Maybe it's skill-based motivated. Maybe it's an opportunity to increase their career and they're just going to be gone the next, right? So it is hard. I think the best way to do it is you hire people that are contractors that know what a full-time employment opportunity looks like. You hire people that are good at what they do, but maybe they just are, they're, they, they, they're really a full-time employee, but they're in a contractor suit. But, but you're right, culture is definitely can be impacted, um, especially on deliverables. How many people here work in services related organizations? Like you're delivering a service and a value. Man, but about half, okay. Uh, that's different than product, right? Screw the product in, install it, leave, right? That's not the case in services. So now, let me make, back that up. They're obviously into the services for the product, but there is a difference between that service delivery in a contractor or a product, to, to borrow that out. But it is, it is hard, certainly, I think, in, uh, in cultures that are impacted. Uh, and I think the biggest thing, at least, too, is that um, for, for most organizations, if you bring somebody in and they're no good as a contractor, and you are, you're gone. So I, th I think it affects attrition. I think people look at that and go, hey, if you're gonna hire a contractor and you're gonna give them the opportunities and take it away from me, then I'm gonna go find another job. So I think attrition is definitely spiked when you can't balance that on a project. How many people here are managers? Several. You know what it's like to build teams. You know who you want on your team. As far as an organization goes, you're the one that makes that culture work. You're the one that establishes those guidelines, whether that's an OKR, whether it's deliverable based, whether it's how we're gonna, how we're gonna finish a project, you, you do that, that's what you do. Thank you for the question. All right, let's talk a little about entry level hiring. Uh, entry level hiring, this is a uh, publication last week conducted by a company called Active Cyber. Active Cyber is an organization that's a learning and development opportunity, a lot of curriculum based things you can buy, participate in, share information on who you are. Um, this was interesting. Uh, you look at the top of 83% of the current job openings are requiring a certification of entry level people. 83%. Back to my point earlier, companies don't have time to wait around for you. Companies don't have time to wait around for the fact that they want you to be productive. They're not going to wait around for you to come up to speed, right? So what they want for entry level people is certs. The top two certifications I've listed there. I'm going to show you a stat on what those certifications look like and how many people of those employed today have those certifications. But think about that. Entry-level people, 
They might have had some skills through college. They might have had some things in a work study, an internship. That's still experience. They might have a lab in their basement. That's experience. People need to see about that in the talent system where they understand and talk about what they've done. Not because they have all these years in a company, but things that they've went on and done on their own by seeking it because they're interested. That's a, that's a big difference. Um, so certifications are, are, are very, very prevalent today for requirements at, this, at the at the entry level. 92% of the people, the candidates, are being asked to be familiar with these things, framework standards and regulations. I've listed those regulations and standards below. Go ahead. Do you believe this could just be an entry level certification? Question was, good question. He asked if the uh, CISSP is an entry level certification, no. It is a difficult certification. It is one that uh, if you look at experienced people that, that try to pass the CISSP, it's not easy. So it's a difficult journey, but it shows also, not because it's required for the job, but it shows your interest in your field. And do you think it makes sense to require it for an entry level job? It's a good question. He's asked, is it required? It should, be, should it make sense? What if you're writing the check? What if, what if you're the employer and you have payroll going out and you want that? And to my point earlier with the jobs available, there's an opportunity right now for employers to be picky. A year ago, it was a candidate market. It is no longer a candidate market today. It is a employer market. Now, that being said, there are some very demanding skills where people can walk if they want or have a, you know, have a focus. We'll talk about the career path in a minute too and I'll show you some of those. But it, it's a good question. Should it be? No. Should a company invest in you to have that done? Absolutely, but that's changed. So, so today it is. Did you have a question behind? Okay. That's right. That's right. That's a good perspective. So he's saying it is. He's saying it could, should be. So that's a good debatable topic. But this is where the industry is headed. And there are other certifications. There's other things to get. There's clearances. There's other things that you can go maintain. But th these are two big ones um, that they're looking at. Salaries. Sal uh, go ahead. I, I really can't hear you. I'm sorry. I'm going to fire that person on my team. No, I put that together. I, that was me. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I worked in healthcare too. So yes, HIPAA spelled incorrectly. The Privacy Act, Portability Privacy Act. Uh, yep. And with... Um, COVID killing approximately 300 people per week and disabling about 10% of our population. How much longer do you anticipate the current hiring environment staying as an employer pick and choose type thing? It's a good question. Thanks for showing the mic. Um, I think for the foreseeable future, certainly. I do. I think there's other things and forces at play around the corner. Look at AI. What's next year's trends, right? I think that there's other ways that we're going to see that change a little bit. What's a global model look like, right? There's a lot of talented cyber people in the world. I mean, there's some phenomenal people. Look at the people, in the, look at the people, the other events that changed the world is Ukraine. There was a tremendous cyber focused teams in Ukraine delivering. So it's a good point, And I think there is the change in that, right? Um, that, that will trends change with time. Salaries has been, I'm gonna cover salaries in a minute too. Salaries right now for intel employees, 53,000. 214. 53,000 is typically your security operations analyst sitting there behind in a sock doing that kind of work. The upper end of that might be somebody with a little bit more broader skills in pen testing, uh, some other things in data, some other things in uh, modeling, vulnerability, things like that. Uh, remote work. Remote work right now is number three on an employee's list of what they're after in an employer. Number three. The first is money. The second is your security in your job. Job security, companies standing that, that's number two. Number three is remote work. Remote work's not happening for, for entry level people. Not as much, because why? You gotta have somebody mentor them, train them, sit with them, watch them. Are you making that back to that point an investment in that person? So 
not as easy to do in remote staff for entry level people. College degrees the last, very few in college degrees. And as far as that goes, I don't see that changing as a trend. We don't require we don't require degrees at my company. We require talent certifications trump that. So that's just something in the industry, our industry, that is not as prevalent. I've seen it in others, but not so much in cyber. Yep. Do you think that the do you think that the for like remote work it'll change to kind of a landscape of you are in the office or something to learn and train for a set amount of time and then you're eligible for remote work or something like that? I think that's right. It's a good question. I think you have to prove yourself. I think you have to show that you can do that remotely. Not everybody can. Uh, I think that transition had to happen during COVID for obvious reasons. However, that's not the case anymore. So I do believe that, uh, and I've always said this to my children, success has rewards. So if you're successful, a reward should be able to not have in the office. I do think there's something missing in the fabric, though, in off without that in office or without getting face to face. How many people were DEFCON last year in this room? Quite a few, almost uh, tons of people. What about a couple years ago, right? It was quiet. So some, some people are still there. So I think that that's a good point. I think that that can be done. I think it depends a lot on the job as well. And certainly when I back to the borrow model, the borrow model, you're gonna have that person pretty much under your thumb or you're gonna to wanna to make sure that there's a deliverable based item that they're giving you that you can verify without watching them and seeing them. Very, very important. Let's move on. Top skills in demand, 22 and 23. These are the top three in a row of, um, is that fuzzy or is that coming out pretty clear? Is that, is that it's good? Okay, it's just my eyes. Um, top three for 22, top three for 23. You'll see some similarities. One of the things I think is interesting in this data, um, and this, this, by the way, is um, only experience level hires. Experience level hires is somewhere around three years plus. Does anything about that way? Three years of, of experience in a company. It's three years. Um, so the top skills. One of the things that's interesting in 22, look at 22, the first skill last year, app security engineers, number one. This year, app security architects. So does that say that they need a higher level talented individual in the workforce because they're using the firm architect or word architect? You bet it does. Or is an engineer somebody that's kind of, you know, got, got, some, got some baseline skills, but they need a little bit more? I find that interesting, um, especially when, when other things get added, right? Like last year it, with, with, with um, Java or .NET, you had had those dev skills. Now, without threat modeling, you're probably not going to get looked at in your resume or a career opportunity. So. Again, that's a, that's, a, that's a personal interest that you have in your employment. Uh, I'm just showing you what's, what's hot today. And for me, in a global talent, um, talent acquisition leader, for me, um, we gotta follow those trends. We gotta sell what our customers are buying, and we gotta deliver top results. Okay. Um, experience level candidates. Let's talk about some trends there. Uh, compensation. This is an interesting one. I've listed the five areas in compensation this year that have dropped for the first time in history. The only other time it was done was during COVID. All five of those skills today are at a lower amount in compensation that they were a year ago. All five. There's one outlier for that only. And you know what that outlier was? Executives. Because the throat to choke has gotten a lot tighter. And so they want somebody to come in and deliver and they want to deliver fast. CFOs worth their weight in gold today. Um, so some of those trends as far as leading an organization, developing people, you know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's an individual where the salaries went up, equities went down. So maybe you have to pull that lever, right? There's, there's three levels of compensation. One's your base salary, one's your bonus, and then one's equity, or maybe some other things that are on top of that, right? As you took, take a look at those pools. But um, now this has a lot to do because of, obviously because of COVID too, right? Obviously, with the last layoffs and the mass changes that we had, that makes sense that that was the only other year in history where salaries come down. But I, I, think, that's a temporary, I think that's a temporary thing. I think that uh, that will continue to evolve. But I also think it's like car prices were a year ago, right? It's went through the roof. It will change. It may be level itself off. But I also think that, um, you know, you pay peanuts, you, or you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. That's what I always say. So you got, you got to be able to pay people, too, for what they're worth. But I'm just saying that as the hiring landscape goes, there could be other levers to my point about your interest, and it's not in base compensation. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you're driven by equity. Bonuses, maybe there's a performance guarantee. Likely not. That's why they call it variable, right? Um, but important to, important to note that that's just a change. 
required skills, this is going to be one we're going to talk about later a little bit, is the required skills of tech and soft, 90%. You know, you can be really technical, and I was, I was in a conversation, is he in this room? I was in a conversation last night uh, by the pool with a brilliant individual. I mean, he leads a 3,400-person team, um, CISO, type, CISO type of background, and um, I asked him what's the hardest thing about finding people? What's the hardest thing about retaining people? And he said, soft skills. You find a lot of really smart people. You're all really smart people. I can tell, looking at you, you're smart people. Especially these four in the front. These, these four are like brilliant. Some Bishop Fox in the room, love it. All right, um, so required skills, soft skills, think about that. Think about as you show up with your family members, loved ones, friends, what do they say about you? They don't say that you're boring, they probably like you. Why do they like you? Because maybe you're like them. So soft skills have been important in the workplace as well. It used to be separate. You always had to separate business from personal, Today, there's a lot more about what you, who you need to be in showing up. Locations don't matter as much, but obviously you'll see Virginia on this list uh, because of the fact that uh, the government sector, right? Pu the uh, pu uh, public sector. California, probably because of the size, and Texas because it's seen a lot of growth. A lot of people moving to Texas. There are certain areas that are hotter for others. And then this is what I mentioned earlier today with the two security uh, clearances. That's the number of security, uh, sorry, certifications today being held by U.S. employees in cybersecurity. So to that point earlier about CISSP and where it fits, or the top one with, you know, three times as many certs, just an interesting data stat. Sir. What do you think split between... You got a mic for him? Uh, yeah. What do you think the split is between federal and uh, non-federal use of those CSB certs? I, um, the, the website that I referred to earlier, by the way, is called CyberSeek. CyberSeek.org. They would have that answer on there because it's super cool about it. You can filter it. Public, private, by state, by title, across the entire, and it's, and it's updated daily. It's a phenomenal site. CyberSeek.org. Yep. Thank you, sir. They would have that. Sure. All right, this is the uh, career path opportunities. This is also from CyberSeek, where I'm going to introduce the website. You can go to CyberSeek.org, plug in what you like to do, plug in how your p career path looks, plug in jobs that are available, plug in other information, and it'll show you. And I did this on the bottom for a pen tester, vulnerability tester. If you look at this, you're going to find out salaries geographically. You're going to find out skills required. You're going to find out other things that are hot in the marketplace and where to get those skills and where you want to go. The side on the right is advanced, so that sometimes goes into execs. But you can see, if you think about the feeder channel from entry-level folks into pen testing, vulnerability testing, from that side, all of them, all of them on that, and that entry level have a path towards that success. You probably came up that way. How many people came up that way from blue into pen testing, vulnerability? I know one did. <laughs> All right, so, but, but check that out because I think that's important as you defer, define your career or you define an organization where you want to go to. My point about promotions today uh, are difficult too. Again, it's an expense of the business, the landscape's super talented, and people are highly motivated. So uh, just more on that. This isn't just being hired for a job. This is about taking a look at what you want to do. Brand matters. My thing earlier about Bishop Fox being the best damn offensive security company on the planet, that's a brand statement. What's your brand statement? This is a menu. I had this over last weekend at a little bar restaurant from Denver, Colorado. This is a bar restaurant, coldest beer in the universe. I loved it. I took a picture of it, right? I had to have one of them. It wasn't that cold, but I thought it was cool, right? It was outside. But here's the thing. It's important you start to think about who you are. If you don't know that question, ask somebody that knows you. Because there's always an introspective view of yourself that others see that you don't. But your brand and how you show up with your brand matters substantially. It is the biggest differentiator today in employment, by far, your brand. It doesn't mean confidence. It doesn't mean cocky. It doesn't mean arrogant. It means positive. There's a simple truth. The simple truth is that enthusiasm is contagious. You show up, you show up excited, you show up ready, people want, to be, people want to be part of that. So think about that as your own brand as you leave today. I'm going to give you some examples of soft skills that resonate probably with you. And you can't make it up, by the way. We'll talk about what that means in your own personality. Um, but marketing your brand in your office, on your teams, 
in job hunts is critically important. Yes. Sorry, we um, so we have a Fortune 500 company. We own other companies, so there's no brand for the company. But I, I was kind of thinking on those lines of kind of branding our SOC team to attract the talent, but not sure how to go about doing that. Well, it's a great point. It's a great question. You know, one of the things that you don't have to have it be all all for one, one for all. That's important, sure. But to your point, if you have SOC teams and they show up because they're working a three three uh, three shifts, and they're they're you know there's a lot of pressure in that. Un uncovering what they're doing. Maybe there's something that that team needs to do in their own brand, right? Maybe there's something as you market and hire people for that, or you look at organizations or you acquire companies. You know, maybe there's something in that brand that collectively meets that older goal, but it could be individual for that particular department. You know, rallying behind that, right? Could be something like that. Okay. All right, this is how you brand, how you show up. Before in the past, the biggest thing in the cog and the wheel on the right is competency. Who are you? What are your skills? Sorry, not who you are like as a person again, but who, who, what skills do you have as a competency? That's the biggest. That's the easiest. As a recruiting professional, my mind says I can find out tech skills all day long. I can give you a test. We can do a challenge. We can understand what, what you're bringing to the table because you got it on your resume or you bring it, right? I got the cert. I got the degree. I got the years of experience. I got the chronological history. Whatever it is, they're going to know that about you, right? What they don't know about you is that first one on the left's capacity. One of the big things employers are looking at today is your capacity to do more. My earlier point at the start of the conversation was capacity matters when things do change or you do want to rely on your people, right? I've been in organizations where uh, if people are too, and this is usually large organizations, if people are too narrowly defined and can't get out of the lane that they're in, they could become obsolete. So if you look at where um, capacity matters, it's the ability to learn and expand your skill set. That's critically important. They're going to ask you that in an interview, not that question, tell me about your capacity. They're going to understand from examples that you give them about why you're able to apply the skills you've learned to deliver results in something they ask you to do. That's really, really important. And the last one is desire. I put the heart moniker up on that because that's the heartbeat, right? Desire is how you show up. Desire is passion. It's interest. It's what wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning to write something down because you, wanna, you don't want to forget it. That's desire. You can't, change, you can't teach desire. Um, it's one of those things that if you have it towards something, bring it forward. Be enthusiastic about it, especially in the interview process or in a company for uh, promotion consideration. These big three things are very, very prevalent today and are going to be even more so in the future. And that's changed dramatically in the last five years that I've seen. So again, before it was all about competency. Now it's about more about that. And to the point we question we had earlier today, when you have culture and teams that you're developing, well, you better have that across the board, whether you're a contractor or full time. Because that, that alone, that desire alone is going to lead to results, right? That's where we link arms, right? We're one team. We take the field together. Candidate selection criteria. This is where those three things show up. Um, you talk a little bit about personality. I put that in the top left. Personality is hired, wired in you as a person at 12 years of age. Statistically proven. Psychologically proven. 12 years of age. So... Personality, as you look about that, you talk about self-motivated. What gets you up in the morning? Nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, hey, I'm going to work, right? But you got to get up in the morning with an interest in what you're doing. And, and personality for that self-motivation is that. Curiosity. How are you going to answer a question about curiosity? How did you grow your career? Are you boring or are you something you want to still learn and le learn more about, right? Are you picking up a trade? What do you do on the weekends? People are going to ask you that question because they want to know you have a curious mind. Character, critically important. Integrity. There's a lot of tests today that companies are giving that'll define what you show up at. Not what you tell them you're going to show up at, not your resume says, but actually a psychological personality test. And they are extremely accurate. I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover one of those in a minute. Technical industry knowledge. Again, back to your competence, back to your degrees, back to your certifications, your industry, uh, technology. And, you know, that's, that's obviously a huge part of the selection. It's not changing. Uh, company team fit to the question we had earlier about culture is critically important. Um, a lot of that where organizations I thought fall short is that they don't pay as much attention to that when they're hiring and ultimately that leads to firing because that person doesn't fit on a team, nobody wants to work with them or you're going to be rubbed the wrong way. Same thing with leadership. They say the biggest reason people leave companies is because of their manager. Statistically be relevant. 
So think about that. Um, uh, chronological history is important too. delivery. Those of you that manage um, are really important too as you show up, but this is how they're gonna select you. These are the six things an employer is gonna look for. This is the top personality traits being sought today. So what I would say to you to do is find three of these. What three of these, if, you, if I went to your significant other or friend of yours, and I said, tell me about them, what would they say? Because I could tell you right now, quick study, self-starter, and critical thinker are really, really important. But so is self-control, initiative. Look at change fatigue today. Look at how many people are going through change, whether it's in our world or whether it's our jobs. Interpersonal flexibility to maintain and manage change and stress, critically important. So find these. Think about those as your brand and bring those forward. When you interview, when you look at opportunities for promotion, these things matter. Highly, highly important. Interview questions. These are the top interview questions today. I, 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 we do a lot of training too with managers and hiring manager training. This is critically important. Too easy to find the competency skills. Too easy to talk about your degree because you geek out on it or your certification. Find these things out. Why should we hire you? Answer these questions. If you're not ready to answer these questions, they're, gonna, they're not going to hire you. The guy that I talked to last night, the CISO, had, he, he selected people that not the, best, not the best qualified or most qualified, but the best fit for his team. And that's what he found out in the interview process. So why should, yeah, why should I hire you? Um, leaving your role. Are you running from something? Or are you going to run to something? Very, very important to understand that question as well. Um, sell me on the company. How many times I have sat in interviews before where I asked the person to sell me on the organization or tell me about the company, and they look at me like a blank stare. And I'm thinking, so you didn't do your research before coming here about what our company does? And we're not going to hire the person, right? So, so think about that. Do your research. You be picky as well. Really, really important. The first one I was going to say, the last topic about the um, t tell me about yourself is um, it's not like where you're from and what you like and what you do on the weekends. It's about tell me about yourself in the capacity we're hiring you for. So think about that. Think about the questions. There's some tremendous content on LinkedIn about this, preparing for interviews, questions you'll receive, what the answer should look like, how you should frame it, what you should bring up, tons of stuff out there. But think about that because that what I see about it, this uh, line at the top, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, as far as talent, spotting talent is, you know, critically recognizing talent important. The cost of turnover is extremely high. Um, organizations should take the time to hire you thoroughly because if they don't, they're gonna take the time to let, let you go. It's just as simple as that. Better spend the time in front. All right, last slide. This is the leap. The first part of that, getting ready, is obviously preparing. you got to get it ran, your brand, your CV, your LinkedIn profile is your online resume. If you don't have that in place, you need to get it in place. Um, the company target. What do you want to do? Who do you want to work for? Go to Glassdoor. What do they say about the organization? A lot of times people, a lot of people look at Glassdoor. Um, sometimes people just got a gripe. Sometimes people got let go. Sometimes people didn't like a coworker, so they, they want to vent. So I'm not saying it's 100% accurate, but it does show you what others say in the organization. Taking the leap is difficult. When you take the leap, it's challenging. It's stressful. You got to adapt in midair. You got, you know, when rejection's difficult in your search. Be prepared for it, adapt and refocus, and you're gonna, you're gonna have a better opportunity. Spot the landing is important because where you're gonna go and where you're gonna end up is gonna be really important as far as where you wanna land. I put some things in the left hand, or sorry, on the right hand side that show a little bit about what that looks like when you negotiate an offer. There's a lot of things just more than base salary. Think about that, what's personally important to you. And the last thing on there is counter offer. A lot of times you're gonna go look for a job and they're gonna tell you to stay. They're gonna, they're gonna say to you, uh, they're, they're going to say to you, hey, why are you going to leave? Why? Because it costs, more to, it costs more to hire somebody to replace you. It's easier to retain you. So counter offers are real. In an in a rec executive recruiting perspective, it's a question I ask every time. The other question I ask is what does your significant other think about your job change? Because that falls apart when you make an offer. And then sometimes people just get pissed off one day. Like, I'm going to get a new job because my bosses treat me lousy, right? They go, they go through the cycles and everything else but they're not really ready to leave, right? So counter offers are really important to think about. So are things like signing bonuses today. We don't do a lot of them as a company. Um, other organizations do. Sometimes they do it to make up the salary differential, but there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into an offer uh, at the, at the uh, end of the day, and a lot more is happening today uh, on that, in that regard. All you bright people, that's the last thing I have the slide. I'll take some questions and wrap up.
Uh, right here. You got the mic for them? Yep. He's got the mic. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you. What would you... Oh, mic's hot. Uh, what would you say your experience is in the acceptance of retention offers from a counter offer uh, for a company? So say you're leaving, uh, you have an offer for a separate company, company B, and then your, your current company offers you. What would you say in your experience personally that you've seen is like the acceptance rate of that I'll stay here offer? Okay, the people that accept the counter offer? Correct. 8%. In our company, it's 8%. I, I manage that through our applicant tracking system. We have a conversion acceptance rate of 92%. So 8% either say no, stayed where they are, took another opportunity. But 92% of that. And, then, and that's a recruiting thing in the beginning to validate who you should be pursuing rather than getting to the end and hoping they take the job. But, but majority, um, uh, if you flip that around, majority of the people that are committed in their job search end up leaving. It's just those that either have a feeling of emotion or respect that end up staying. It's not about money. It's that we want you, we want to keep you, right? So you gotta think about that. And as a follow up to that, would you say it's more senior individuals that are taking the counter offer to stay or lower? Lower. Lower, interesting, lower. okay. Yep. Do you think it's always necessary to negotiate your salary at the end to kind of give, when they offer you a, um, amount, a dollar amount, should you always? ask for more? Or no, it's a, good, it's a good question on the negotiation. What I'd say is this, wage transparency laws that are uh, in effect today and increasing in America, um, you're going to know what that range is, right? But you can't price it too high. So there's certain things that maybe it's to this gentleman's point about remote work. Maybe you're going to take a job because it's three days remote, right? Maybe that's a benefit to you, right? So not always, but I, but I think there's an opportunity for you because you're going to wait another year before that's going to come around again. Right? And if they've made you the offer, their mindset, you're already a member of their team. You're no longer a candidate. It's much easier at that opportunity to start to get what you'd like a little bit more of and bring that up, certainly. Yep, a lot, a lot of variables to pull in that. Yep, got a question. Oh, go ahead. Right here. You mentioned a current trend towards kind of contract work. From the talent side, is that a good option for someone looking to grow their experience and skills or should they stick to full time? That's a good question. I think there's a lot of personal uh, processing in that answer. Um, I think when you are on your own um, and you're not part of a team, um, it's easier to, um, it, it's, it's, I, I think it's a little easier to be part of a team than an independent. You know, just how you feel inclusive as well, right? But it's not, it's, it's really a personal uh, taste in that too. Uh, yes, sir. On your first slide, one of the truths you list is the resiliency of cybersecurity and downturns. But this year we've seen tons of layoffs. Uh, Rapid7 is doing layoffs this very week. Cisco has laid off a ton of their security teams. Uh, Bishop Fox laid off 13% of their workforce earlier this year. That wasn't 30. 13. Yeah, 13. Yeah, do you think 30. that uh, that resiliency is still true, or is that going to be, do you see that changing as I think it's, I, I think the more? resiliency in the market, certainly for our industry, is certainly still true resiliency. I think you had a lot of overstaffing. You had a lot of expectations that things would continue. You had a lot of change since COVID happened. You had a lot of overinvestment in the industry of market, investors, cyber overall. Uh, and then also with, with the change, let's face it, in the last nine months, companies aren't spending more. They're spending about what they spent before. So if you overhired in advance, I think that trend was still going to go up, and it didn't, you're overstaffed. But so I do think it's still very resilient, highly, if you look at those slides of supply-demand. So you foresee that resiliency staying a fact as cybersecurity matures as a field? I do. Okay. I do. Have we got time for one more? Or, and I'll, be, I'll stand for a little bit. I'm catching a plane out this afternoon, but I will stay a little bit for questions. Uh, I think he was, oh, go ahead. Do you have any information on how the bottom end of the entry level uh, salary has trended over the past few years? You can look at historical aspect of that. Check out CyberSeek. Uh, you'll see some of that in, in salaries because you'll see the range. What you'll see in the range is, think about that range before this year. That range is going to be, over time historically, is going to increase in that, in that window. That's, that's the easiest way to look at the data. Sure. But my, well, I guess what I was getting at is if employers are, if employers are asking for more certs from their entry-level people because they want to hit the ground running, 
but they're not paying entry level people more for having those certs than they have in the past. Like, does it make sense? Does it still make sense to attain those certs when you're not going to get paid more for having them? I think it's a ticket to the dance. It's the price of the ticket right now. It's what it is. I, I don't think that's going to change. You got one more? Eve? One more. Thank you for the questions, everybody. Really appreciate it. Some, some good content. So you mentioned soft skills, and you mentioned talking to somebody who said that people are kind of lacking soft skills and it's causing an issue. Um, my question is, how exactly do we get into the position to even display those soft skills? Because what I'm starting to kind of see is that uh, soft skills really only happen when you're face to face, like in maybe in emails here and there, but like it you don't really get those opportunities if you're not even getting past like the, uh, the application part. And then when you come to events like this and stuff like that, sometimes you're just meeting people who are trying to sell you stuff and not really people who are looking to find those people with those skills. It's a good question. I think two things. One is uh, that should be part of your CV. You should have some of those things on there. You're right. There's algorithms right now. They're screening things out before even a human looks at it. So let's just say you take self-initiative. And in your description, you show how that is. If somebody's looking for that, they will put that in as a keyword and find that. So include that. You don't need to put your address anymore. Put, put some of the things that define you. It's important. Everybody, thank you for your time. Very much appreciated today. Thank you very much.